I feel that I'm among friends, so this has been very fun. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is um, a new physics model that could explain the mini boon excess. Um, but before doing that, let me just um, um, let me just motivate. Uh, why do we actually care? Oh, it's it's dying. All right. Okay. So, um, so um, what I want to the question I want to ask is um, if Minibun has actually observed the mechanism behind neutrino masses, right? Uh, so let me make let me be a bit more specific. I will be looking at my computer because I have slides here, but I'll do the blackboard. So there's these are basically my notes. Um, so um, the first question I want to ask is. Uh, can you can you see what I write here? So it's why are neutrino masses so small, right? This is actually, I think we have been asking this question for the whole week, um, and uh, it it's interesting that some kind of thought can lead us to different models and different structures of why neutrino masses are so small. So the first thing that I want to um, to point is that if we just try to um, to repeat what happens with charged fermions uh, in the neutrino sector, say you do this. Um, if you don't understand anything, any of this, just just let me know, especially the students. If you just try to do this, uh, that works. It you make you may make the Yukawa. Uh, so the neutrino mass here would be. Yukawa, uh, VEV of the Higgs over root 2, where VEV of the Higgs is uh, 246 GeV. So if you just do this, it works, and you just need to make a Yukawa 10 to minus 12 or 10 to minus 11, and that's fine. But the funny thing is that when you write this term, necessarily, this guy here, this uh, we call right hand neutrino or sterile neutrino or standard model singlet, um, this guy here has no, has no uh, quantum number, right? It has no gauge quantum number. So you can write this term. You can write this term, um, which is a Majorana mass term for this guy here, for this uh, right-handed neutrino, and that changes everything. Uh, the f th there are two things that are important about this term, which are first, this mass will change the mass matrix of neutrinos, and therefore it will change neutrino masses themselves. But more than that, um, you see, let's take a step back and let's think about the Higgs sector. When I have the Higgs sector, my Higgs couple to uh, fermions, and when the Higgs gets the VEV, the fermion gets the mass. So there is one prediction that I have there, that the mass of the fermion, it tells me what is the, um, the coupling of the fermion to the Higgs. So we know that the Higgs likes to decay to bottom quarks just because the bottom is heavier. That's a very interesting prediction of the standard model. Here, you lost the prediction entirely. This mass can be anything. This mass can be 0, can be 10 to minus 10 electron volts, can be uh, 10 to the 13 uh, uh, GeVs. So you have no idea what is in there. Of course, this is a logical possibility, and maybe uh, reality is exactly like that. But uh, the question I want to, well, not the question, but the, the, the direction I want to go is um, let's assume that this mass is forbidden by a gauge symmetry, right? So let's assume that neutrino masses are zero to start with because there is a symmetry that forbids it. This is just blah, 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 right? So you, you, you can do many models. I'm not saying that other models are wrong and mine is right. I'm just saying that this is my starting point. So if you don't believe this, you can, you can just get coffee. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is the starting point. So you need to believe this right now, at least for the next uh, 33 minutes. So. Um, Okay, so let's do that. So let's say that I have a new U1 symmetry, a, 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 a gauge symmetry, let me call U1 dark, in which the standard model, the entire standard model has zero charge, and then my right-handed neutrino has charge, let's say, plus one. It doesn't matter the number because the, the, there is an overall normalization that is free there. 
So um, when you do that, the first thing that happens is that, uh, so let's assume that I have three of these guys, one for each, uh, for each node train, right? So I'm just mimicking uh, uh, the seesaw mechanism. The first, the first thing that happens is that anomalies show up here. So if you don't know what anomalies are, um, anomalies are, uh, it's basically a consequence of the Kairi structure of the standard model. And making a long story short, uh, a, a quantum field theory needs to be anomaly free to make sense. And that's not the same as saying that if, if you have these things, eventually the standard model will break down. No, 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 no. Anomalies break down the model at all scales. So a, a, a theory with anomalies is completely sick. So you need to solve this thing. And the easiest way is to add another guy. Let me call this. Uh, the notation is going to be messed up because I'm, I'm not in the right slide yet. But I, I can fix that eventually. I just do a copy here with charge minus one. Now, when you have this and you're trying to relate this guy to neutrino masses, so this is now forbidden by a symmetry because this guy would have charge plus one. This guy's plus one, charge conjugation minus one, bar plus one. So there's a charge two here. This is forbidden right now. Uh, but the nice thing is that when you have this uh, field content, it it really looks like you could build up a neutrino mass like this. So let me do like this. I'm just doing the conjugates here because I want left-handed fields. Here would be right-handed fields. So I have three states, uh, including my neutrino. And this is the exact field content of inverse seesaw. If you don't know what is, in the is an inverse seesaw, you're going to know it soon. Um, the inverse seesaw... Um, the structure that we want to achieve is this, uh, some m here, 0, m, 0, capital M, capital M, and a small mu term. The structure we want to achieve is this. This, this structure is forbidden right now, but the structure we want to achieve is this. And the neutrino masses in this kind of models would follow like a mu term, the Dirac mass, the uh, sterile mass square. So. Um, if this is small enough, it can make neutrino masses quite small. Okay, so if I want to get there, um, what is uh, what is the um, doesn't matter? What do I need to do to get there, right? So to connect the neutrino, the left hand neutrino to the right hand neutrino, this guy to this one, uh, I cannot put the Higgs anymore. Because the Higgs has no charge under that U1 dark. So I need to have a new scalar. Uh, so let, let me call phi. And let me call phi 1. So that's a scalar doublet with charge um, 1. Phi plus 1. And let me do like this. SU2. Um, so this is whatever it is. Uh, this is singlet. Singlet, this is a doublet. So um, this guy here, when this field gets a VEV, it, it can uh, get you the, the M, the little M term. We have some Yukawa here. Let me call Yukawa phi. Now, uh, this term here, N right, N right prime. Let's see what is the chart of this guy. So uh, this thing here is, um, where is that? Minus 1. And this thing here is plus one conjugate bar plus one. So the overall charge is zero. So I can write whatever mass I want here. That's a drawback because I was um, um, motivated on the fact that we lost uh, uh, a bit of the um, uh, predictivity of the model. And, and unfortunately, I cannot solve that. But you know, let's just assume that you all bought this. Uh, and now the mu term, um, there is something that I, it, this is something I cannot I cannot do because I have this with charge minus 1, minus 1. Oops. So I need something here with charge 2. So let's add a scalar. Let me call S2, which has charge 2, so that you cancel all this charge. This is the dark charge. Um, and I put some Yukawa here. I don't know. Let's call Y2. OK? So you do that. Um, there's another term that you can write for this mass, but this mass really doesn't play almost no role in neutrino uh, mass mechanism, so I don't care. Um, and for, um, 
for reasons that I don't want to talk about, but if you want, I can talk about eventually. Uh, so wait, let me add this guy here, S plus 2 is a singlet. I also need a singlet with chart 1. Making a long story short, that singlet is because when I do this uh, field content, I have a global symmetry, an accidental global symmetry. And since you know that U1 dark, I, I set this gauge. Um, if I break it, I'll break this accidental global symmetry. I'll get a goldstone, a massless particle. There is a theorem, right? The goldstone theorem. I get the massless pseudoscalar, uh, pseudo and uh, massless pseudoscalars are typically a problem. Um, so I, I don't want to deal with that. So that's my field content. That's my starting point. Uh, that's my starting point. Okay? But now, the nice thing is that when I write down my uh, scalar potential, I'm not going to bother you with all the formulas. You can find that in the paper. Uh, maybe I should have written the archive number of the paper somewhere. 1808 25 uh, 025. That's the archive number of the paper if you're interested in that. Um, so uh, I'm not going to bother you with the, the, the whole uh, scalar potential, but part of the scalar potential has terms like this. For instance, uh, some, let me call, I don't know, uh, another mu. This mu is not the same as that one. Let me call mu1, uh, phi1, which is a doublet, Higgs, uh, S1. Right? This term is allowed by all the symmetries. You have terms like mu2, S1 square, S2 star, and you have terms like, uh, let me call lambda A, um, phi1, H, S1, S2. Now, why do I care about these terms? Diagrammatically, uh, this term here is something like, so, um, yeah, diagrammatically, this term here is something like this. Phi 1, I hope you can all see here, uh, H, S1. Uh, so this is very similar to what happens in, uh, if you think about, in uh, type 2 uh, seesaw models, where when these two guys get the VEV, it induces a VEV for this one. Right? So basically, you can, you can assume that this guy has a pos positive mass term, so it starts with no VEV, but at the moment that this one gets a VEV, it creates a tadpole here. So basically, you have VEV, VEV, uh, sorry, VEV, VEV. This is just a mass, uh, 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 a coupling, a massive coupling. And this becomes a tadpole, which necessarily induces a VEV. So the VEV of phi 1, according to this term, could be written if parameters are, you know, on the right with the hi right hierarchy. Something like mu 1, VEV of the Higgs, VEV of S1 over mass of phi 1. So that's interesting because now this mass can be light uh, in, in, in some sort of nature. If you make this at the TV and you play a little bit with these this numbers, this mass can be light. And the other term, this one here, is similar. You have S2, S1, S1. So the value of S2, let's say this you have a mu2, goes like mu2, uh, value of S1, uh, mass of S2. Right? So, um, I is everything okay up to now? So, um, oh, the mass in the denominator, uh, diagrammatically, this happens because uh, the mass in the denominator is, let's say, how do I do that? Yeah. So, if you think about something like this, this is connecting somewhere like in uh, type 2 seesaw, um, you have a propagator here. So, that's the mass of the denominator. If you look at, you can also uh, see that on the scalar potential itself. Uh, you have a parabola, I guess, uh, x squared. If you add a linear term, uh, uh, the, the non-zero VEV will be proportional to the curvature of this parabola, which is the 1 over m squared, right? I mean, it, it will be inversely proportional to the curvature. At the limit that I send the mass to infinity, uh, it doesn't matter if I add a small kick to it, right? The VEV is zero. Okay, so why, why am I doing that? I'm doing that because now um, this term here becomes the VEV of S2 
this term here becomes the value of phi 1, and this term here is, is given by hand. But now all this, these guys can have induced values, like in a type 2 seesaw, which can allow you to lower the entire scale of the whole system. So um, the no neutrino masses in this kind of model would be something like this. Now I need my notes. So you come up with a neutrino, a left-handed neutrino. Um, you connect the phi 1. Now you have a right-handed N. Um, you have a mass term. It becomes N prime left-handed. You connect to a S2 mass term. Uh, where is that? This is N bar uh, N prime N. You connect to a phi 1 again, and you go back to neutrino here, right? So this neutrino conjugate. Um, uh, I think I assume that these fields are right-handed, so this would be conjugate and conjugate. And then here you can have the induced guys, where this is H, S1, 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 H, S1. So the consequence of that is that um, the neutrino mass here, it's a dimension 9 operator, right? So it basically the effective Lagrangian that gives you neutrino mass um, is something like, there's a bunch of Yukawas which are just not right, uh, but it's something like H uh, dagger H S1, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, sorry. This is LH, LH, S1 to the 4 over lambda to the 5. Y you can put the conjugate and all that eventually. Um, so that means that the, the scale of neutrino mass now needs to be much smaller because this is quite much suppressed, right? When you, when you had the um, uh, Weinberg operator, uh, this was only lambda because it was dimension 5. And then the, 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 the nature of scale is at 10 to the 13 GV. Now it's lambda to the 5. Higgs valve here, and you have this valve, which can be whatever you want, so you can make it light, it's a singlet. So basically, neutrino masses would go like valve of the Higgs square, uh, valve of S1 to the 4, and then some lambda to the 5. And you can show that this, if you make this at the, the let's say, GV scale, you can easily make this around the, uh, you know, 10 to 100 GV, very easily, and you get enough suppression uh, to get neutrino masses. Okay, that's my five cents on the neutrino mass model. So what does that give you um, in, in terms of phenomenology? So I told you that this guy here, this valve could be light, and this is the main valve because all the other ones are induced by that, that breaks the dark U1, right? So if it's the main valve that breaks the dark U1, it means that now you have a Z prime, or let's call it a dark Z, which uh, whose mass goes like some gauge coupling and then the VEV of S1 plus small corrections. If this VEV is at the GV scale, then you, you, you can naturally correlate a light mediator to light neutrino masses. And that's, that's the key point of the model. Um, well, that's one key point. The second key point is, I told you that the standard model has no charge under this, this dark symmetry. So the dark symmetry doesn't, the, the dark uh, mediator doesn't talk to the standard model to start with. But there are two things that can happen with abelian symmetries. One is you can have kinetic mixing. So anything that you have that talks to the dark side and talk, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> talks to the dark side and talks to the standard model uh, will induce a term in your Lagrangian like this at low energies, F mu nu, F prime mu nu, where these are the kinetic terms of the photon and the dark photon and some epsilon. And this essentially means that now your dark photon or your Z prime, Z dark, whatever, will talk to everything that is charged with a small coupling. The second thing is that neutrinos, because the right-handed neutrinos are charged, but neutrinos mix with the right-handed neutrinos, now they can actually talk to the dark mediator. OK? So in some sense, you are giving neutrinos a charge because they mix with something that had a charge to start with. So that's, that's the, it would be the dark portal, right? So 
this guy doesn't like to talk to the standard model, uh, but he talks to the standard model because of mixings. So let me give you um, uh, the mini boon idea. So, um, okay, so I, I'll stop here for the model for now. I'll go back to it eventually. But if you have any questions on the model, you should shoot them now. No, no, I don't. I don't. Uh, that's actually a good question. That's something that we are looking at, but um, to be honest, we are having a hard time to find a dark matter candidate that actually does something to the model. I mean, you can add like a vector like dark matter, boring, boring, but um, getting like a real dark matter candidate that does something intrinsically to the model, we couldn't find it yet. Yeah. So um, uh, any other questions on the, on the model side? Oh yeah. Yes, yes. So there is there is all the constraints from dark photons will apply here. All the constraints from dark photons. I can get to that in a second. Okay. So um, so let me talk to you about minibone. So uh, before you know, let's stop theory for a second. Um, minibone is a um, is an experiment Fermi at Fermilab where. I think you saw this several times by now. Protons hit the target, uh, create a bunch of stuff, like pions. You focus the, the sign of the mesons that you want. Let's assume that it's pi plus. Uh, then you have a decay pipe uh, where the pi plus will decay to mu plus and mu neutrino. And now you have a perfect beam of mu neutrinos. Wow, perfect. Apart from all experimental stuff that can happen, apart from the fact that pions also decay to electrons, sometimes pi minuses are focused, so there are new mu bars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But let's assume that you have just mu neutrinos here. Then you have a bunch of dirt, so that uh, you stop all the muons, you don't see them in the detector. And now you have a detector, which uh, is a mineral oil detector. So whenever something hits the mineral oil, it first thing that the first thing that it does is uh, scintillates a bit. Uh, so you see like some isotropic light shining. And the second thing is that if a charged particle traverses the, the oil here, uh, it emits Cherenkov, just like I told you uh, on the first talk. And then here you have some PMTs that detect the Cherenkov light. And basically, um, uh, every particle has its own kind of signature, so uh, muons would give you rings of Cherenkov. Uh, electrons would give you like fuzzy rings because they scatter around. So uh, imagine that you're emitting a Cherenkov ring, but then you scatter, then you scatter again, you know, and then you really doesn't focus very well. Muons don't scatter almost nothing. So they just emit Cherenkov ring and that's it. And then you also have pions, which decays to photon, photon. And then the photon converts and give you two um, uh, electron-like Cherenkov rings. So it gives you something like a fuzzy ring and a fuzzy ring. This would be a typical pi zero signal. Uh, the interesting thing about minibone is that minibone cannot distinguish a photon from an electron. Minibone can only see Cherenkov light, and only charged particles produce Cherenkov light when it crosses minibone. So uh, although we have seen this excess, this anomaly, uh, of electron-like events, we don't know if these are actually real electrons, right? So it could be something else like photons or uh, uh, this thing that I'll tell you uh, now. So how would we explain minibone in this context? If you need internet, I can give you the, uh, the password eventually, but nor do not during the talk. <laughs> So um, how can you explain minibone with that? So the idea is this. You produce your neutrinos, and neutrinos will get to the detector. Now, neutrino mix with dark neutrinos, which can interact via dark uh, gauge boson. OK? Uh, let me put a little n, because I think I'm using little n. OK? Now, this, uh, as I told you, this dark gauge boson can kinetically mix with the photon via that operator. So another mixing. 
and the photon can actually scatter on the electromagnetic field of nucleus like carbon. So minibon is basically CH2, uh, so carbon is the most important one. And this scattering could be something that breaks up the carbon that we call incoherent, or could be something that doesn't break the carbon, scattering the carbon like the carbon is a big ball of charge. So that would be a coherent scattering. Um, but now you produce this guy. Um, this guy uh, is unstable because it mixes with neutrinos and, and it's heavy. So via mixing, um, it can decay to a neutrino and a dark uh, gauge boson. And now the dark gauge boson is also unstable because it's massive and it can decay to a pair of E plus E minus. Now this is the key point that, um, ah, sorry, the dark neutrino, I forgot one more mixing, because of the kinetic mixing with the photon, can decay to E plus E minus. So the beauty of the model is, in some sense, at least for me, is that you have a mixing, 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 mixing. So there is mixing everywhere, small mixing, but there is still mixing everywhere. And thi is this small mixing that will give you um, the minibond signal. So uh, how can this mimic uh, electron-like events in minibond? Well, I told you that uh, minibond can doesn't really see electrons or muons. It only sees sharing of light. So the only thing you need to get is a sharing of ring that is similar to an electron sharing of ring. So that means that if I have two electrons, if they have some big open angle, we have a big ring here, we have a big ring there, they are clearly distinguishable. If I have two electrons uh, on top of each other, the rings are on top of each other, it's impossible to see anything. And then there is a point where the precision is important uh, and you start uh, distinguishing that. And the point where precision is important is basically when the opening angle between the electrons, uh, I shouldn't do that because this is a Feynman diagram. The opening angle between the electrons, so you have, let me, you have your neutrino coming, uh, neutrino leaves because this is this guy, and it gives you E plus E minus, okay? This opening angle here, theta, should be smaller than about 12 degrees uh, so that uh, Minibon can, uh, will not be able to distinguish the two Sharenkov uh, rings. And then this event will be interpreted as electron-like event. There are other uh, complications in the model, which means, uh, not in the model itself, but in the analysis, which um, not only you have this angle here, but uh, maybe I should make this a little bit bigger. Just one second. Let's make a big Minibon. So your neutrino comes, you know the direction of the neutrino beam, right? I mean, the beam is there, you just know where it comes from. Um, the neutrino that goes out doesn't really matter. And then you have this electron-positron pair um, that needs to be collimated. I think this is about 12 degrees. And the other important angle is that there is a uh, an angle here, let's say, to the center of the, of the E plus E minus pair, or to the center of the energy deposition, let me call alpha. And there is a distribution of, uh, so the, the, the excess that Minibon has observed has a distribution, has a spectrum in energy, but also in this angle here. And that plays a cru crucial role because um, the events of Minibon, they are somewhat quite spread in angle. And if you produce, if these guys are, if everything here is very light, uh, imagine this, you produce a neutrino, right? Neutrino hits a target, um, but I told you that this is coherent scattering, so this is very light, this is coherent scattering, so the neutrino doesn't change direction very much. So it continues forward, this guy. Now, it decays, if it's very light and has lots of energy, the decay products will all, all be forward. So if everybody's light, uh, all events will be in the forward direction. And that's not consistent with the excess. Yes. And they will produce electron neutrinos. Yes. So, and this is a very light background. This is a background, you. yes. It can mimic exactly yes. the same way the event that you are talking yes. about. Yes. Comments, please? Yes. 
Yes. <laughs> okay, so, um, so what Ernesto is saying is that I told you that I didn't really follow up on this muon here, so I was cheating. These muons can go here. They will have some penetrating power. And uh, muon decay is a probabilistic event, right? So it has a lifetime. It can decay early or later. Um, when the muon decay, it goes to this. And this guy here, if, if it gets there and scatter, it will give you an electron. And that's a background. That's one of the major backgrounds in um, uh, Minivon. Now, um, when Miniboon was running, there was a detector that not many people talk about, Cyboon. And Cyboon was, in some sense, the near detector of Miniboon. And Cyboon measured this, this the flux. They, they measured these guys here. So basically, um, exactly, there is, a, there is a measurement that constrains your, um, your uh, new is from muon decay uh, background. So basically, if you look at Minibone, uh, you can Google it at some point, uh, but you have like events here uh, per MeV. Uh, you have energy here, reconstructed neutrino energy. Uh, and then you have backgrounds like this, and you have data like that. So uh, uh, these backgrounds are divided in into several backgrounds. So one of these backgrounds here, um, I don't know, maybe something like this. Uh, this region here, this guy's here, they would be uh, the new E's from mu. And there is an associated error bar, but uh, according to the experimentalists, it doesn't get there. There are also uh, other sources of background, like this would be Nui's from kaons, because uh, uh, some of these kaons will not be focused, uh, but that you can also measure. Um <coughs> uh, what else? You also have uh, backgrounds from pi zero decays, which are large. So these are pi zero miss ID, which basically means that uh, instead of having this, imagine that neutrino comes, it produces just a pi zero. Okay, so neutrino hits the nucleus, produces just a pi zero, and then pi zero decays to photon photon. But uh, photons in uh, in uh, the scintillator, uh, sorry, in the mineral oil of uh, Minibone, takes about uh, half a meter to a meter to convert to any plus and minus pair. Um, so basically, one of these photons could actually leave the detector, and then the other one can convert inside the detector. And that will be exactly the signal they have. Uh, so this, uh, this is one of the backgrounds. This is actually a major background. It's the most dominant background. Um, there are other processes like you could resonantly produce delta resonances. Um, my god, the thing is blinking there. Uh, you could produce a delta resonance, uh, which goes to pi zeros, and then you have the same, et cetera, et cetera. But assuming that the experimentalist did uh, a fine job in finding the backgrounds and all that, there are still the excess. And this could explain the excess uh, as long as this opening angle is small and there is a distribution, I don't know if you can see it there, uh, on the cosine of the angle with respect, of the angle of the Sharenkov cone uh, ring with respect to the uh, beam, to the direction of the beam, which uh, it's something like this. This would be 1, this would be minus 1. Uh, let me do like this. So this would be the background, right? And this guy here would be the signal. This is the anomaly, the, the excess. So uh, if you look at it, the signal is 
is not isotropic, but it is fairly isotropic. So that points to a specific region parameter space of these masses. And if you're interested in that, the, the specific region is something about um, Mn of the order 400 MeV. Uh, rem remember that the, the, the beam energy in minibone is typically within uh, 0.2 and 1.3 GeV with a, f uh, maybe I can just do like this. This is the flux of neutrinos. This is about 0. Point maybe 0. 0.8 GeV. This is about 0. 0.2. This is about uh, 1.3, and it, you can just you know squeeze it as you want. So um, it would point to a fairly massive guy with respect to the energy of the beam because you want to produce this and stop it as stop it as possible, right? So you kick uh, something there, and then the there the end is it has a very small boost, so it's going very slowly, and then when it when it decays, uh, the decay products uh, neutrino and z dark they will be fairly isotropic. But if the Z dark is light enough, then when it decays to be plus and minus, it's very boosted. So the plus and minus will be um, uh, boosted forward. So basically, the mass of the Z dark would be needs to be below about 60 MeV. And then there are some gauge, uh, some gauge couplings and mixings that need to show up there. Now going back to the question of Farinaldo on the um, uh, kinetic mixing, there are very strong constraints on this kinetic mixing parameter. And if you look at the parameter space of, let me do A here, the mass of the dark photon versus the kinetic mixing coupling, there is very, very broadly, like a region here which is ruled out, and then there is a region over there which is ruled out as well. Um, there may be some stuff here going on, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, we need to be in this region here. It's a, it's a corner where uh, this guy here is about 20 MeV, and up here is 60 MeV because of the, the experimental constraint. And uh, I think this kinetic mix is of the order 10 to minus 3. We don't, we, the kinetic mixing doesn't really matter because we also have a mixing to play with, um, and then there is a lot of uh, parameter space region there. Um, so yeah, so this is how you could explain minibone with this kind of model. Uh, let me see if I have something else to talk about. So, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so, um, oh, I'm out of time. So, um, okay, so the point that I want to make is that, um, at least in my opinion, it's an exciting possibility that uh, from a story that you tell to explain why neutrino masses are so light that requires some gauge symmetry, etc., you can act actually get to the minibun excess. And, and, and that opens up some interesting uh, uh, possibilities that imagine that neutrino mass, the, ma the mechanism of neutrino mass is not at a high scale. It's type 1 C salt doesn't tell you that the mass of the right hand neutrino is at a high scale. If the mechanism of neutrino mass is at a low scale, Neutrino scattering experiments like Miniboon or the SBN uh, 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 program could actually be looking at it. And even Miniboon could actually have observed the mechanism of neutrino masses. I mean, obviously, this may be ruled out uh, in a year. Uh, it's probable. But it, I think it's an exciting uh, direction to follow. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Questions? What kind of experiments can rule out the model? Ah, that's a very good question. Uh, what, what do I want to raise? So um, one possibility is just look at the SBN program. So the SBN program, um, I'm not going to draw the proton hitting the target, etc. again. It's the same beam as Miniboon. It's exactly the same beam. It's called the booster beam, the booster neutrino beam. Um, but the detector is a liquid argon detector. So I told you that my uh, dark Z over there is very light, which typically induces coherent scattering. Coherent scattering, uh, the, the cross-section for coherent scattering is proportional to the atomic, well, in this case, not the atomic number, the number of uh, protons to the square. So in carbon, you have a factor of 6. In argon, you have a factor of 18. So you have three times more protons, which means a cross-section, so the cross-section